Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled The Power of the Flower, Botanical Insecticides and Horticulture, brought to you by MGK and Mycorrhizal Applications. I'm Chris Manning, an editor with Greenhouse Management Magazine. Joining me today are Robert Sirani from MGK and Michael Hull from Mycorrhizal Applications. Today's webinar will explore the benefits of botanical insecticides in horticulture. Attendees will learn about the wide range of botanical insecticides that are commercially available, as well as receive technical information about the most active ingredients. Additionally, there will be tips and information on how these products fit into an integrated pest management program. Just a few notes before we get started here. If you have any questions at all during the presentation, please use the chat box to your right to enter your questions and we'll address those during a Q&A session following the presentations. Also, please note that a recording of this webinar will be available in a few days. Each of you will receive an email with a link to the recording so that you can review the presentation or share it with your colleagues. If you want to make sure you know when it's available, also be sure to follow Greenhouse Management on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and or Instagram where we will be sending that out as well. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Robert, Michael, thank you so much for being here with us today. And Robert, why don't you get us started? Thank you. I would also like to thank the team who have put this presentation together uh, for their support. I also would like to thank everybody who took time out of their busy schedule to attend this webinar. Today, uh, we would like to discuss botanical insecticides. My name is Robert Schreini. I am an entomologist at MGK, and I will be co-presenting today with my fellow entomologist, Michael Hall, from Mycorrhizal Applications. In today's discussion, I would like to follow this outline. I will start by providing a background, and then discuss pyretrum and neem in details. And then I also included a discussion on insecticide synergies because they play an important role in insecticide resistance management that is very applicable for today's discussion. I will then hand over the lead to Michael, who will discuss individual products and will provide practical technical, technical information on their use. Botanical insecticides are classified under biorational insecticides, which are generally defined as compounds with natural origin. In today's webinar, we will only discuss botanical insecticides within a larger category of biorational insecticides. Generally, these birational products have lower environmental impact than their older conventional alternatives and provide a higher value for integrated pest management purposes. Why are we interested in botanical insecticides? Plants and insects have a long, approximately 300 million years of coevolutionary relationship. In this evolutionary arms race for survival, plants face a major challenge. They cannot run away from danger. We can do that, but plants cannot. As a consequence, one of the many different strategies that plant developed to combat this is the production of secondary metabolite, in other words, biologically active compounds. Prior to the onset of synthetic insecticides, Humanity relied on botanical insecticides to manage pests in agriculture and, and or in human health. This slide lists the most uh, commonly used botanical insecticides in the history of pest management. Pyrethrum, neem, sabadilla, various essential oils, rhenia, rotenone, and nicotine. Some of these are still with us today. In fact, MGK, as bot MGK's botanical portfolio includes pyrethrum, neem, and sabadilla. But some of them, uh, like rhenia, rotenone, and, and nicotine, for instance, are no longer used because of toxicity concerns. In today's presentation, I really I'm only going to focus on pyrethrum and neem because sabadilla currently only has a limited use pattern in agriculture. Please allow me to briefly introduce MGK and our connection to botanical insecticide development. MGK was founded by Alexander McLaughlin, John Gormley, and Samuel King in 1902 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the com company is and its manufacturing plant is still located. MGK was founded as a spice importer, and that kind of triggered MGK's interest in botanical insecticide 
because spices arrive packaged with pyrechrome flour to prevent insect damage to occur during the shipment. MJK took a step to develop technologies to quantify the biologically active compound of these flowers and create a standardized extract that provides continuous performance. The first pyrethrum-based product was launched in 1927, shown in the picture, Evergreen. And Mike, and you will see the, you will hear about the great grandchild of this product in Michael's presentation. What makes MGK unique in the field of botanical insecticide development is the, our long history of vertical integration, from cultivation to extraction to product development and commercialization. We are also actively engaged in discovery and commercialization of new botanical insecticides, one of which is, is pictured here. A major milestone in MGK's history occurred in December 2012, when Sumitomo Chemical of Japan acquired the majority ownership of MGK. This allowed us to expand our research collaboration across many disciplines. One of the examples is our co-presentation here with my colleagues from Microsoft Applications. Following this brief introduction, let's continue our discussion with pyrechrome. Pyrechrome is native to Dalmatia, which is located in modern day Croatia. It has a, pyrethrum has a long historical use. It has been used since Roman times, primarily for ectoparasite control. The bioactive compounds of pyrethrum are located in the flowers, more precisely in the seed, which contains approximately 94% of the total active ingredient content of the plant. The fundamental requirement for a pyrethrum based insecticide is that we have to grow the crop. Today, there are two main growing regions for pyrethrum. One is in East Africa, the other is in Australia. The two primary pyrethrum production areas are vastly different from the agronomic perspective. In Australia, pyrethrum is produced under modern agricultural framework, whereas in Africa, pyrethrum is produced by small sustainable farmers. In Tanzania, which I can't pronounce to save my life, MGK is working with approximately 14,000 growers to grow pyrethrum on the average farm size about, of about 0.8 acres. Personally to me, pyrethrum is an interesting example of the connection between growers across great distances and cultures. In Tanzania, 14,000 small growers are supporting their families by growing pyrethrum that provides growers here in the US and, and other countries with a safe and effective insecticide that in turn supports their families and their livelihood. Pirate Room to me is really a story of communities and families across the globe. I would like to briefly invite you on a quick journey from Pirate Room flower to the product to illustrate the process and its complexities. Over the course of about four to six months, Pirate Room growers are hand harvesting specifically aged flowers to maximize yield on a, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, based upon the maturation of the crop. Flowers are either dried under the sun or in community, community dryers provided by MGK. Dry flowers are collected and moved to our extraction plant where flowers are ground and the active principle is extracted. This, yields, this process yields a dark uh, viscous material known as crude extract that contains the active principles and also plant resins and, and waxes. This crude extract is then refined to this golden, light golden color technical grade material in our manufacturing plant in Chaska, Minnesota. This technical grade is then used to formulate our products. The pyrethrum plant produces six biologically active close related compounds called pyrethrine asters. All six asters collectively act on the nervous system, which is our information gathering and processing system. Within the nervous system, pyrethrins act on a voltage-gated sodium channel, shown here, which are large protein complexes embedded into the membrane of neurons. Pyrethrins interfere with the normal operation of sodium channels that compromises signal integration and propagation, leading to the death of the insect. Let's clarify some terms used in the description of pyrethrum. The major difference that we need to note is the difference between terminology used for the plant and its active constituents and pyrethroids. 
pyrethrins are natural sourced versus pyrethroids are synthetic compounds modeled after one of the pyrethrin esters. Let's look at the four key attributes of pyrethrins in more details. Pyrethrins have a contact mode of action. They degrade rapidly in the environment. They have broad spectrum activity, and they have excellent occupational safety profile. Due to the contact mode of action of pyrethrins, obtaining coverage of the target is very important for efficacy. Since pyrethrins act on the voltage-gated sodium channel, insecticidal activity of pyrethrins is rapid within a time scale of minutes. Insecticidal activity of pyrethrins follows a unique sequence from excitation, flushing, and knockdown to eventual mortality. In some cases, especially with mosquitoes, repellence is also part of this intoxication pathway. Since pyrethrins are high, show high affinity to insect nervous system, they are active at very low concentrations. The second key attribute of pyrethrins is their rapid degradation in the environment. The primary driver for degradation is UV, but pyrethrins are also sensitive to the pH conditions of the solution. So storing diluted pyrethrins above uh, pH 7 is not recommended. The rapid degradation of residues can also be an advantage because it prevents bioaccumulation and also allows pyrethrins to be applied close to harvest. The third key attribute of pyrethrins is that they have a broad spectrum activity. While this is certainly okay, the case, there are differences in species and life stage susceptibility. For instance, aphids are quite susceptible to pyrethrins, whereas sting bugs, the other hemiptera are not. A key consideration of using pyrethrins is their cross resistance to pyrethroids, which is not surprising because pyrethroids were modeled after uh, pyrethrins. However, Pyrethroid-resistant insect population may not be effectively controlled by pyrethrins due to cross-resistance. Pyrethrins also have an excellent occupational safety profile. MGK's pyrethrum technology is unique because it's OMRI and NOP compliant, combined with favorable label and formulation technology that is easy to use with common application equipment. Let's delve deeper into the activity of pyrethrins. One of the first visible signs of pyrethrin exposure is flushing. Flushing describes a behavior when insects forcibly leave their harborages when ex exposed to pyrethrins. This, sli this slide shows the time course of the flushing response in German cockroaches. On the y-axis, you can see time in minutes required to flush all at 50% of the German cockroaches, and the x-axis, you see different compounds. You can see that pyrethrins elicit a flushing response within minutes, very quickly after application. In fact, there is a product called Flusher used in professional pest control for exactly the same purpose. After flushing, we see the next response, the KD effect in insects. Knockdown describes insects that are unable to ride themselves while their legs moving rapidly. This slide describes the time cost for knockdown in houseflies. The y-axis, again, is time in minutes, showing the knockdown time required for 50% of the treated in the houseflies to reach the knockdown stage, and you see compounds on the x-axis. The data shows that pyrethrins are very fast-acting, even when compared to the synthetic pyrethroids, such as permethrin. Pyrethrins cause knockdown within a few minutes in most exposed insects. Operationally, another key aspect of pyrethrins is their rapid UV-driven degradation and corresponding short residual efficacy. The short residual efficacy of pyrethrins is demonstrated in this example against Colorado potato beetles. The work was done under two conditions, greenhouse conditions and field conditions, using two time intervals, one hour and six hours after application. The y-axis shows percent mortality from 0 to 100, and the x-axis shows the two different conditions. Under field conditions, the residual efficacy of pyrethrins declined very rapidly. By six hours, the efficacy was less than 50%. In contrast, under greenhouse conditions, the residual efficacy of pyrethrins extended to six hours. 
fundamentally because of the different environmental conditions that prevail in the greenhouse conditions versus under the field conditions. One important general rule of thumb is that pirate rains really have very limited to no terrestrial efficacy. This slide summarizes the chronological sequence of pirate rain exposure. Initial exposure to pirate rains result in an uncoordinated movement, the flushing effect, that forces insects to leave their harborages. Pirate rains also rapidly incapacitate the insect, the knockdown effect, that not only stops injury, but also in many cases remove the insect from the plant, with the help of, help of gravity, of course. Knockdown develops into a paralytic state that eventually leads to the death of the exposed insect. A critical and important aspect of this uh, time course is that the events take place within minutes to hours, so it's a very rapid, um, and pirates have a very rapid mode of action. Let's move on now and talk about neem and azadirectin. Neem is a fast-growing tall tree native to the Indian subcontinent. The neem tree is a source of an enormous diversity of bioactive compounds, that have been used from the dawn of civilization from medicinal to oral hygiene to insecticidal purposes. Every part of the tree is utilized for some purpose, including the wood for construction because it's resistant to termites. From our discussion today, we are focusing on the, on the insecticidal properties of the neem tree. The most insecticidal active compound in neem is azadirectin. Azadirectin, the source of azadirectin, is the seed. Azadirectin is unique among uh, botanical insecticides because it belongs to a class of insecticidally active compounds that affect the growth and development in insects. These compounds are also known as IGRs, and there are a number of synthetic IGRs available in pest management. Prior to our discussion on azadirectin, I would like to highlight two important aspects of pest infestations. The first one is the high biotic potential of pests, insect pests, illustrated here by the theoretical population increase by green pea aphids within a two months period of time. Let's add the actual numbers of aphids to the chart to make it more informative. Under optimal conditions without constraints, a single aphid can produce a population of over 30 million individuals within a short period of two months. Let's step back and appreciate the challenge or the headache that insect pests pose for agriculture and horticultural productions. The second aspect that I would like to highlight is from the perspective of the host plant. In general, the amount of damage caused by a pest is dependent upon its life stage, excluding viruses. This table uh, illustrates the consumption of various life stages of Colorado potato beetles over the lifespan of a single generation. Out of the entire food consumption, 62% of a single individual occurs in the later instar stages. Why is this important? This is very important to consider because longer a past population is allowed to persist on the crop, the higher its damage potential will be. So how food consumption and high reproductive potential relates to other directives? Azadirectin, shown here, is a highly complex terpenoid compound with a complex mode of action. One set of action relates to azadirectin acting as a feeding deterrent at very low concentration. This table shows some examples of the threshold concentration of azadirectin that effectively inhibit feeding of selected species. Feeding inhibition occurs generally at less than 1 ppm level, at very low concentration. In some cases, such as migratory locusts, would almost starve to death before feeding on azadirectin. Operationally, the anti-feeding effect of azadirectin provides an immediate impact by reducing feeding injury and damage. In addition, lower food intake also slows the rate of development of an organism and reduces the probability of its survival. The second major mode of action of azadirectin is its action as an insect growth regulator. Growth and development in, in the insect world revolves around the fact that insects, ca insects carry their skeleton on the outside of their body. This comes with a monumental drawback because the exoskeleton cannot grow along with the organism. As a consequence, insects must shed their exoskeleton in order to accommodate growth 
and to reach adulthood, that reproduction can occur. The process of shedding the exoskeleton is known as, the, as molting and is tightly regulated by circulating hormones. Azadirectin is structured similar to a key insect hormone, ectysin, that plays a critical role in the molting process. It inhibits the synthesis and release of ectysin. Azadirectin also has a broader activity on the endocrine system that is responsible for the synthesis of other hormones that play a critical role in a molting process. The overall impact of azadirectin is to create a hormonal imbalance that prevents normal molting to occur. In general, many of the exposed immatures are unable to complete the molt and are trapped in their old skin and health capsules. Even those individuals that survive the molt will experience reduced overall fitness. The IGR activity of azadirectin is broad spectrum and it has been well documented for over 400 species. While azadirectin does not cause immediate mortality of the exposed insects, its complex and interacting modes of action amplifies the level of control. Today, we focused on the two most important modes of action of azadirectin, namely the anti-feedant and the IGR effect. However, both repellency and sterilant activity was also noted in certain species. For example, if I were a migratory locust, which I'm not, I would not want to make contact with azadirectin. The virility of male migratory locust is severely compromised, but the rest of the effect is rated R and not webinar appropriate. In summary, insect populations can explode very rapidly, and as they persist on the crop, their damage potential can magnify. Pyrotrins provide an excellent tool for the rapid reduction of pest population, whereas azadirectin provides a significant additional benefits by reducing the rate of development of the pop population via anti-feedant and IGR effects. I would like to move to my final topic, a discussion on insecticide synergies, where this equation is actually correct. When we discuss synergists, we need to place this discussion within the context of insecticide resistance. Insecticide resistance is the ability of an insect to survive doses of the insecticide that is lethal to the normal population. The severity of the problem is illustrated by this chart for Colorado potato beetles. Within a span of about 50 years, Colorado potato beetles have developed resistance to 50 different chemistries. Colorado potato beetles are not unique. Resistance is common in insect species and across chemistries. This slide shows the basic model of insecticide resistance development. Insecticide resistance is a pre-existing genetic phenomenon, meaning that it exists as a random mutation in a native population at a very low frequency. When we use an insecticide with the same mode of action, we place a selection pressure on the population that favors the survival and reproduction of the individuals that are tolerant to the specific insecticide. This results in the death of the susceptible genotypes and an increase in the frequency of resistance genotypes. We will reach a point when the insecticide will no longer control the pest population. The most effective way to manage insecticide resistance is not to reach this point by rotating between different classes of chemistries. The IRA classification on an insecticide label provides an easy to use guidance for developing such rotation program. The primary mechanism of insecticide resistance are the following. Behavior avoidance, which is very well documented in case of German cockroaches. Physical adaptation, that reduces the rate of insecticide transfer. Metabolic resistance via increased enzymatic detoxification. And also mutations of the target site that no longer allow the key, in this case the insecticide, to fit into the lock. To amplify these challenges, various mechanisms of resistance can coexist in the same individual. As a consequence, the best strategy is not to reach this point by using pesticide judiciously and appropriately as part of a holistic pest management program. Synergists are important tools for managing insecticide resistance. These compounds are not toxic themselves, but they act by inhibiting specific detoxification enzymes by which 
making resistant insects functionally susceptible because they are unable to detoxify the, the insecticide. However, because of their mode of action, synergies primarily help with me resistance mechanisms that are metabolically based. This graphic illustrates the mode of action of synergists. Let's meet the players first. The, this represents the target site of the insecticide. For instance, in the case of pyrotrins, this is the voltage-gated sodium channel. These Pac-Man-style shapes are representations of the detoxification enzymes, and these red diamonds represent the insecticide, the active ingredient. Let's start with a scenario when the synergist is not being used. The detoxification system encounters and met metabolizes some of the insecticides, but sufficient concentration of it will reach the target site to elucidate the insecticidal effect. Now let's look at a scenario when a synergist is used. The synergist blocks the detoxification system, allowing more insecticide to reach the target site. In insecticide-resistant insects, the impact of this interference will be much larger and further magnified. In general, synergists will improve the efficacy against both susceptible and resistant individuals as well. One of the most widely used insecticide synergists is piperonyl butoxide, also known as PBO. You can see the molecule here. PBO's development was intimately connected with pyrotrins. It was developed during the Second World War as part of the war efforts to extend the utility of the available pyrochrome supply. PBO is generally formulated at various ratios with pyrotrins. Generally, the higher the ratio, the more effective the combination is. However, there is also a diminishing return in many cases. In general, in our experience, the 1 to 5 to 1 to 10 ratio pyrotrins PBO provides the most benefits. Traditionally, PBO was derived from sassafras oil, but today it produced synthetically. Therefore, it's not organically compliant. On this slide, I would like to show the impact of combining pyrotrins with PBO against two strains of Colorado potato beetles, a susceptible strain and a resistant strain. The treatments which were applied were pyrotrins alone and pyrotrins in combination with PBO at the 1 to 5 ratio. The column of uh, labeled LC50 is the lethal concentration of pyrotrins required to kill 50% of the exposed insects. Lower the value is, the more toxic pyrotrins against that particular strain is. But you can see that there was 17-fold difference between the toxicity of pyrotrins against the susceptible and the resistant strain. Against the susceptible strain, 9.3 ppm was sufficient to, to achieve the LC50, versus against the resistant strain, we needed 17-fold higher concentration, 160 ppm. The impact of pi, uh, on the addition of PBO on toxicity can be, show, can be seen on the SR or synergist ratio column. You can see that the LC50 values were reduced by about threefold by the addition of PBO against a susceptible strain. However, this effect was magnified against the resistance strain where there was a 32-fold reduction or increase in toxicity uh, with the addition of PBO. In summary, synergists are an important component of, of the insecticide resistance management toolbox. In the case of synergist, the equation one plus one equals three really shine through because synergists interfere with the detoxification system of insecticide, making them more active. In addition, the same enzymatic systems are also used in the biotransformation of endogenous molecules, such as hormones, putting additional stress on the organism. In addition, many of the synergists are quite good solvent, so they also improve the efficacy via solvency effect. One key aspect of synergists, the commonly used synergist PBO, for instance, is that they are all synthetically produced and cannot be used in organic production. Thank you very much for listening. Now I will hand over the presentation to my colleague, Michael, who will discuss individual products and provide practical information on their use. 
All right. Thank you, Robert, for your great explanation of the active ingredients of the MGK products. I'm going to jump right in here and go over our product line and how the products can be used by professionals and homeowners. So I wanted to start out with uh, just some background about mycorrhizal applications. Uh, we are the master distributor for the MGK products for the greenhouse, turf, and ornamental market. We are sister companies under our larger Sumitumo chemical umbrella. And if you're looking for the distributor for the agricultural market, you're going to be looking for Valent USA slash Canada. So for our products, we do have uh, professional and retail SKUs. Uh, the first being professional, uh, they're going to be labeled for growers. Uh, they have a broad label and application rate. The Pyganic Specialties Active is going to be a 5 point uh, or 5.0% pyrethr pyrethrins, and the Azera Pro is going to have a 1.4% pyrethrins and a 1.2% azadiractin. Both of those products are OMRI listed, uh, and then the Evergreen Pro is going to be a 60% 60, 60 PBO synergist and a 6% pyrethrin. All these products are available in quarts and gallons, and they're available through our distributors. We also have our retail products. Uh, these products are geared towards homeowners. They do have UPC codes uh, so that garden centers and, and other customers are able to sell them. They do not require a CPA certification in California. Uh, the Pyganic Gardening is going to be 1.4% py pyrethrins. The Azera Gardening is 1.4% pyrethrins and 1.2% azadiractin. You will notice that they are the same uh, rates for the professional product for the Azera Pro. Uh, the label and the amount that you're able to use is much different in the Azera Pro versus the Azera Gardening. Pyganic Gardening comes in three different sizes, uh, 8 ounces, 32 ounces, and 128 ounces. And the Azera Gardening only comes in two sizes, the 8 ounce and the 32 ounce. These products are found in garden centers, hydro stores, and other retailers. I wanted to start out and show a picture of our Pyganic Specialty and the Azera Pro. This is what the bottles are going to look like when they come to you. And again, you can see that both of these products are OMRI listed. A little bit about uh, the application rates for these products. For a conventional sprayer, you're looking at Pyganic Specialty mixing between 16 and 32 fluid ounces per 100 gallons of water. And you're going to apply at a rate of 3 gallons per 1,000 square feet. The Azera Pro is going to be 53 to 107 fluid ounces per 100 gallons, and you're going to apply that product at a rate of 2.3 gallons per 1,000 square feet. For a backpack sprayer, as we know a lot of growers are using these now um, in the greenhouses, you're going to look for a Pyganic specialty at uh, one fourth to a one half of a fluid ounce per gallon. And you're going to apply that at three gallons per square feet again. And then the Azera Pro is going to be one to two fluid ounces per gallon of water and apply that at a rate of 2.3 gallons per 1,000 square feet. Azeric Pro is uh, unique in that it is currently our only product that's labeled for a root drench application. Uh, we do know that there are some growers that are looking for uh, insects control, such as fungus gnat larvae and root aphids, and the Azera Pro is labeled to do just that. Uh, you're looking at mixing of 53 to 107 fluid ounces with 100 gallons of water. You're going to apply to moderately moist soil, so you don't want to apply this to uh, soil that is completely dry. You're going to distribute the solution evenly to the entire target area to make sure that you're going to get all of those insects. And then you're going to thoroughly wet the soil, but do not cause significant runoff or excessive drip from your pots. And then we have our Evergreen Pro. Uh, this product is not OMRI listed, so keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, the use of this product. Uh, the application in our greenhouse, you're going to be looking at 12 to 24 fluid ounces per 100 gallons in a conventional sprayer, and 1 to 2 teaspoons per gallon for a backpack sprayer. Uh, this product is also labeled to be grown or to be used in hydroponically grown vegetables. So a water system treatment, you're looking to kill dipterin larvae, and the rates are listed there. So I did want to touch on how MGK products can be used in an integrated pest management system. Uh, there are multiple different ways that this works, and I wanted to just touch on a few of these. Um, as far as pesticide resistance goes, uh, like Robert was saying, we know that pests or insects have the ability to build up resistance in their population when you use the same um, insecticide over and over again. 
uh, with this being or with this in mind, the MGK products are all going to be a group 3A product. Uh, if you use those in rotation with insecticides from other groups, you're going to be uh, you're going to avoid resistance a little bit better. Again, the product is a flushing product, so if you apply this and tink mix it with these other insecticides from different groups, you're going to get that flushing action that's going to make those insecticides actually work better. Uh, again, our product is six esters, which makes it a little bit better on insecticide resistance. Um, and then we also have the PBO Synergist with the Evergreen Pro, who that is going to help uh, avoid some of those blockers that insects naturally have. Uh, for IPM application, there's always a, uh, also a large range of application rates for these products that growers are able to use. Um, this means that it's really in the growers' hands of how much they need to use. It is broad spectrum control, meaning that it's going to target many different insects and it targets immature and mature life stages. The products can be applied up to 10 times per season and we do recommend not applying within three days unless extreme pest pressure. All right, so another aspect of integrated pest management and MGK products is greenhouse cleanup. So a grower can use this, these products prior to planting in a greenhouse uh, that has not been in use for a growing season. You also can use them as cleanup before shipping. Uh, so because of the low pre-harvest entry or zero pre-harvest interval and a low REI, you're able to clean up these plants before they go out on a truck. Uh, you also are able to clean up beneficial insects. Uh, this isn't gonna be right for everyone, but as we know, some homeowners um, do not like to buy plants from a garden center if it has insects on them, even if they are beneficial, uh, because the MGK products are broad spectrum, they will kill the beneficials as well. So you can clean those before shipping to a garden center. And then they're also able to be used for exposed human pests that you may have in the greenhouse as well. Uh, another, just some key greenhouse pests that it controls, it's going to control aphids, fungus, gnats, thrips, two-spotted spider mites, whiteflies, mealybugs, leafhoppers, and many, many more. Uh, please refer to the labels to see exactly what all insects these products control. One thing I did want to bring up is that MGK uh, can work with beneficial insects. Uh, again, we went over that they will kill your beneficials, uh, but that is also good in a sense that they can be used when your thresholds uh, that your beneficial insects could not keep up with. Uh, they also have a low residual, meaning that after you apply them, you're going to be able to reapply your beneficial insects very quickly uh, to redo um, or to start over that beneficial insect plan. And then again, like I was saying before, you can clean up for retail sales. I also wanted to uh, touch on the low residuals and the phytotoxicity of these products. Uh, there is a 12 hour REI, like, we were say, like I said before, uh, there's no pre-harvest interval. They are listed as caution so that they are slightly toxic to humans and animals. We do uh, recommend the use of PPE. Please refer to the label for the exact uh, PPE for each product. If you're tank mixing, uh, make sure that you follow the strictest chemicals label for REI and PHI. For phytotoxicity, again, these products haven't been tested on every plant out there, so you need to make sure that you do a phytotoxicity plant or test before you apply this to your entire greenhouse. You're going to want to observe for a 10-day period uh, to see if there is any phytotoxicity, and then it is going to be up to the grower to test these application rates. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about are some tips for success with using the MGK products. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that the pH of the water needs to be between 5.5 and 7.0 before mixing. Uh, you're going to want to apply when pests are present, um, but not when there's a heavy infestation. Do not wait until a heavy infestation um, so that you have the best success with these products. Mix only enough for immediate use. Do not mix um, a ton of the product up and store it overnight and keep working. Uh, you want to just use what you're going to use for that uh, moment and then use it all uh, and then remix it for the next day. Uh, the Exposure to UV light causes rapid de degradation of the products uh, in sunlight. So make sure that you're not applying when the sun is up or when there are uh, foragers present um, because they are also uh, deadly to bees. 
The products do need constant agitation when they are mixed. So make sure that there's some sort of bubbler or some sort of mixing agent that is um, in your tank. Do not wet your plants until runoff. And then the Pyganic Specialty and Azera Pro have a two-year shelf life, and the Evergreen Pro has a three-year shelf life. Uh, we do recommend storing in the original container in a cool, dry area out of reach of children. So for the next part of the talk, I wanted to talk about our gardening products. These products are going to be aimed towards homeowners. As you can see, they are a concentrated product, and they are both OMRI listed. Uh, the concentrated product can be a little bit worrisome for some homeowners, but it's not hard to use. You're just going to be mixing it at 1 to 1.4 ounces per gallon, and then one gallon will give a homeowner 1,000 square feet of coverage. We do not recommend these products for indoor use or for any indoor pests that you may have. Uh, the Pyganic Gardening, again, comes in three different sizes, the half pint, quart, and gallon, and the Azera Gardening comes in a half pint and a quart. Uh, these products are, again, a concentrated product, uh, and there is no, we currently do not have a ready-to-use product. Uh, the reason why is being that we have proven efficacy of our concentrated products. Uh, these products have been trusted and used in food production since the early 2000s. A, a ready-to-use product has a shorter shelf life um, if it's mixed. Concentrated products also allow homeowners a range of applications, so depending on what they're using it on, they're able to control how much they're using. Again, we recommend only to mix what you need uh, to conserve the product, so do not, you know, if you want a half gallon mix at a time, uh, do half the rate that it's recommended. A uh, ready-to-use product would also mean that the consumer would have to pay more uh, because you're going to be costing more at shipment because you're shipping a bunch of water that the products have been mixed in. Um, one downside is that many homeowners do not want to mix chemicals, and for sales reps in these garden centers, they, the customers may need a little bit of additional encouragement uh, or support in order to get them to purchase the products. For our uh, products, for our professional products, they're going to be available nationwide uh, through horticultural uh, customer distribution. Uh, visit mycorrhizae.com, click on For Professionals, then click on Find a Distributor, and you will be able to find what distributors in your state are selling the products. Our products are registered in all 50 states, uh, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And with that, uh, I wanted to end and uh, give anyone any an opportunity for any questions that you may have. Hey everyone, we're going to get started with our questions now. This is Chris Manning from Greenhouse Management. Um, I'm going to start with a question for Robert here. How many insects, Robert, have developed a resistance to pyrithiums? I'm mispronouncing that probably, but I apologize. But um, there's a question there about that, and I wondered if you had, if there's a kind of a clear answer to that, because I know that can be a hard thing to define. Okay, this is Robert. Thank you very much for the question. It's an excellent question. I hope you can hear me. Um, pyrotrines and pyrotroids have cross resistance. So in a sense, the phenomenal success of the pyrotroid class in the past 40 or so years had some negative impact on pyrotrine resistance because of the cross resistance. Michigan State University maintains an excellent database for resistance. I, uh, a couple of months ago, I looked up pyrotroid and pyrotrine resistance. There's about 344 species have been reported to have resistance to pyrotroid, which in many cases provide cross resistance to pyrotrines as well. And the case number was staggeringly about 5,582. Um, one interesting that resistance is a very complex phenomenon and one size does not fit all. So it's really difficult to say uh, how many um, insects actually developed. It's not just insects, it's specific strains, specific strain managed by us. So when I worked with uh, the potato growers here in Minnesota, uh, some locations basically uh, dealt with as for past populations um, walk under their ancestors' management. So if the grandfather or, or a family uh, did not rotate insecticide, they could be uh, local strains of the insects that the 
test that uh, can develop significant results. One uh, uh, number which really uh, brings home this message to me is group initiated where the upregulation of carboxylase, carbo carboxyl classes, which are important for OP, organophosphate, and carbamate uh, resistance, uh, actually also confirms some level of uh, up to 3%, 3% of the total protein weight of an aphid could be that one enzyme. Actually, it's two enzymes, but uh, so, so the, the response from a insects to pesticide pressure can be phenomenal. So in, 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 in short, yes, there's cross resistance, but uh, uh, just because a, a strain is resistant to pyrotroids, it's not necessarily resistant to pyrotroids. The likelihood is high, but that, that's not always the case because it comes down to the actual mechanism of resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Michael, we have a question here for you now. Um, what is the expected residual of the, these products when applied outdoors in full shade? Is there is there kind of a a broad? I, obviously, this can vary in different markets and whatnot. But is there kind of a broad expected residual? Uh, yeah. So the residuals really depend on the presence of sunlight. Um, I know that the question says that it's in a full shade. Um, the issue is that with pyrethrins, uh, they are they do have very low residuals. So with our product, you're looking at only a couple of hours um, of a residual in full shade, uh, whereas if it was in sunlight, it would be way, way less than that even. Uh, with pyrethroids, uh, the synthetic version, sometimes you can get those products that have multiple days of a residual, but that is what makes our products OMRI listed and a little bit safer is that they do not have those extended residuals. So you are, you are, you are only looking at a couple of hours of residuals. Thank you. Robert, uh, another question here for you. Um, in your work, have you observed any translaminar properties um, or for intermittent mispronouncing as well as our detergent. I might again I'm mispronouncing that. I apologize to the listener and to you, Robert. But is there is there have you observed any translaminar properties in this case? Thank you very much for the question. It's another excellent question. Uh, it is azadirachtin is very intriguing and unique because it has both translaminar and also they can be taken up by root. Uh, they have been observed uh, uh, efficacy against uh, uh, various aphid species by transaminar activity and also uh, 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 root uptake can sh show some effect on various crops, including cabbage, lettuce, and such, uh, against uh, leaf miners as well. Personally, I also did some work with azadirachtin as a tree injection, and we were able to find azadirachtin months after in the leaf tissue, months after the tree injections were complete. So yes, Zodirectin has these very intriguing applications that can magnify its effect. Please remember that as a direct in uh, the primary mode, uh, uh, route, of it, route of entry to the body, besides research where we inject it directly to insects, but it's through consumption, ingestion. So having a transaminar activity, it also protects, the, uh, it, it, it ensures uh, consumption, but also protects the molecule from degradation. So yes. Thank you. Michael, another question for you here. Do either of these products affect stink bugs? Uh, yes. So both of the products, uh, all the products that we sell are going to be broad spectrum. Uh, they are listed for multiple different hemipteran pests. The issue with stink bugs is that the adults are very mobile. So uh, in getting or using these products, you have to get broad coverage and even coverage in order to control something like a stink bug. Uh, the products are going to work better on the younger life stages uh, because they are less mobile. Uh, so, you know, applying when you see the adults around might not be the best time. It might be best whenever you start to see the nymphs emerge um, because you're going to get a better control of those products uh, with using them when there are nymphs and the younger adolescent insects present. Thank you, Robert. Um, another question for you here. How much does hard water antagonism contribute to mechanisms of insecticide resistance? 
Excuse me, could you please repeat that? Yeah, how much does um, hard water affect pesticide resistance? That's another excellent question. Um, water itself is an important part of pesticide application because basically that's the primary carrier. So most of the solution which we are actually spraying is water. Number of attributes of water are important in pesticide application. Uh, how this ties to resistance is really more, most effect, more effective the application, the less likely that resistance will be. There will be selection for uh, differential survival between different uh, genotypes. Con those have some level of resistance versus others who are susceptible. So among the water uh, qualities, you know, hardiness, pH, and microbial contamination comes first. That's very important. Uh, water hardiness has been a major uh, a variable, especially in, to, in the use of herbicides. Some of the herbicides, like clatodine, for instance, are, are very sensitive to hard, hard water. Uh, this has been less uh, documented in the case of insecticides. From uh, our perspective, we are more concerned about the pH of the water and the microbial contamination of the water. High pH rapidly degrades pyrethrins, and both, both pyrethrins as, as a directive because of the alkaline hydrolysis uh, and microbial contamination uh, of the water will also increase the rate of degradation of the compounds. Why is it important? Because those that make the poison, uh, we have to make sure that we are able to deliver the effective conservation to insects. Insecticide resistance is really driven by sublethal exposure and selection of those individuals which show some level of tolerance to that, that active ingredient. So basically, those are the ones which gonna reproduce produce the, and increase the frequency. These, these are the ones, those, are, those genotypes are the ones which drive the production. So I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, water, cleaner the water, the better uh, the overall application will be. And if I add one more thing uh, back to Michael's comment about sting bugs, uh, uh, sting bugs, uh, the, the timing of application is very critical for sting bugs. In general, we recommend that the, because of the high affinity of pyrethrins to the sodium channel of insect, weight is an important factor, but coverage is way more important. In the case of sting bugs, both high rates and also uh, uh, coverage becomes critical for success. But those are not, the sting bugs are not the primary targets for pyrethrins, unfortunately. They are quite resistant, not just to, to pyrethrins, but any other uh, classes of industries. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Michael, one here for you. What would be the recommended PPE for the homeowner product use? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that it can cause an eye irritant. So you want to have some sort of goggles or um, safety glasses on when you're using the product. Uh, other than that, it really is uh, just wearing long sleeves and uh, pants and tall socks, shoes, making sure that all of your skin, exposed skin that could get in contact with the product is covered, and then wearing gloves. So making sure that you have gloves on when you mix the product, uh, making sure that it can't get in your eye, wearing some sort of safety goggles, as well as wearing long sleeves and pants. Thank you, Robert. Um, another one here for you. Are there any toxicity concerns with regards to waterways and soil microorganisms? Sorry, could you please repeat that? I have yeah. a hard time with my computer. Mm -hmm. Are there any toxicity concerns with regards to waterways and soil microorganisms? That's another wonderful question. This is a great uh, conversation. Uh, pyrocrines degrade really rapidly. That's a plus and a minus at the same time. It is uh, the minutes to hours degradation, especially under UV exposure, uh, makes bioaccumulation and impact on soil microorganisms and waterways. Uh, uh, some of the other chemistries which have uh, higher affinity and longer residual efficacy can uh, impact uh, on target organisms in the soil, also in the water. 
one key aspect of synergist that which we haven't touched on is their potential potential for potentiating some of these negative impacts. I don't know if I answered this question, but but pyrotrins are really that's one of the the uh, the main advantage is of pyrotrins, which we are also suffering from because of the lack of residual efficacy. It makes it much more important to time the applications correctly. Is that they have limited environmental uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you. And then I, th I believe our last question here, um, it's also for you, Robert. Do you have insecticides, or are there insecticides rather, to combat the America, the South American leaf miner, or is also known as the tuta eb soluta? Is there is there anything on the market that could be available to growers in your experience to to help combat that? Um, I wish our product products would. Uh, would help with Tuta, uh, Absoluta. Unfortunately, they are not uh, because both of our products are primary contact. Uh, if I want to choose one, probably as a direct work on slightly better uh, against this, this leaf miner. Leaf miners are one of the uh, uh, one of the big challenges for pest control, pest management, uh, pest management crops. So um, I don't have a good answer for it. Uh, I have not worked. Uh, directly with other chemistries against Tuta. We have an active research project. This is actually one of the species which we are looking at, but we have nothing point pro that would provide sufficient control. Hmm. And it really comes down to the life cycle, matching the life cycle uh, and biology of the past with the attributes of the product. Uh, the best way to use our product is really uh, kind of matching the knowledge from both sides, knowing the biology and knowing the attributes of the pesticide. That's what Michael and I was trying to do today, give you guys a background on, on how and why uh, these chemistries work. So we will be able to make better decisions on what we want to use. Thank you. Uh, Michael, question here for you. Um, it, the question here is just compatibility with other insecticides. And kind of, in, I believe that this question is in relation to some of the other product, the products you're mentioning, but um, are these compatible with, with other insecticides? Uh, yeah, so in the talk, I talked about uh, tank mixing. Uh, the, the thing that you wanna keep in mind when you are tank mixing these products is you wanna make sure that the group is not a group 3A product. So if the product that you're looking to tank mix, make sure that it's labeled for the ability to tank mix. Uh, not all products are and then make sure that it's not in the same group. So you don't want to uh, apply another insecticide or mix another insecticide that's in that group 3A. So that's kind of what you wanna look for on the label. Uh, if it's not in the group 3A and it is also labeled for um, tank mixing, then again, you just follow the strictest uh, label uh, for the PHI and the REI for whenever you're gonna be able to return back into your greenhouse. Thanks. Um, Robert, question here for you. Are botanicals like neem and the, the perthians compatible with microbial biopesticides? You guys are gonna kill me, but could you please repeat it? Yeah, no problem. Um, are botanicals I'm actually here. Like... I'm actually here and listening, but my computer is just being problematic. Yeah, no problem. It totally happens. Um, are botanicals like neem and perithians compatible with microbial biopesticides? That's a wonderful question. That is that is an in that's I love it. Uh, so yes and no. It depends on how you apply it, and and. Oh, I don't have current data, so please take it with a grain of salt. But depending on a microbiology, uh, 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 let's say we are using a BT, a Zentari uh, or, or Dipal type product, those are really work because of consumption. The, the insects need to consume sufficient concentration of the, of the toxin, the endotoxin, to be effective. Now, if you combine it with, at the, at the same time, with neem or as a directin, which has anti feeding effect, you're probably going to reduce the consumption and acquisition of PT toxin. Now, PT toxins also work against only against the first and second instar stage, the younger larvae or immature stages. 
uh, as always, coverage is not always 100%. So there's going to be always escapees and egg-laying or reposition is never synchronous. We would love to do that, but we'd love to see that, but it usually doesn't happen. You will have a larvae that escaped the application just by the fact that they were emerging later or there was no, they, they avoided the, the treatment. Rotating uh, an azirectin product, for instance, with a, with a, a um, BT type product would be beneficial because then you can uh, magnify the impact of the IGR effect. Pyrocranes are also quite uh, uh, important in this rotational program because they can serve as knocking down those escape individuals that escape the initial BT application. So again, it's just depending on the pest species and the crop, creative and uh, rotational programs can be designed utilizing the, the uh, attributes of the product to have the highest impact on the pest population. So yes, I would use them together, uh, but depending on the target pest and the crop, I would use them differently in terms of the rotation. I hope I was able to answer the question. Uh, I'm happy to add other thoughts to it if needed. Thank you very much. And uh, Robert, one more here for you, and I, I do actually believe this will be in fact the last one. Would a bioinsecticides uh, such as venerate be, venerate be considered a synergist when used with hygienic? Well, I mean, synergism is a, is a, is the definition of synergism are, 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 is quite broad. So, in a sense, when you mix two active ingredients, yes, they are synergizing uh, each other because they have different modes of action. So, they put a lot more stress on the individual who is exposed to those that combination. Uh, in st strictly speaking, uh, synergists are compounds that are not toxic themselves. And that's not the case with the, with the other virus. I don't know if I answered the question or not, but but that to me is the is is the difference. If a if a if a, a compound it has toxicity in itself, then we are looking at broadly defined additive effect that can show up as synergism, especially if we talk about resistance strains. Uh, but PBO, MGK264, and other synergists are not toxic themselves. So if you spray it on an insect, you're not going to have an effect. Adding them to various uh, chemistries, they potentiate that effect. Thank you very much. Um, everyone, thank you so much for attending today. Thank you to Michael Reisel and MKG. Thank you to Michael and Robert for giving us their insight and their time today. Hope everyone enjoyed. Um, again, if you want to catch this again in the coming days, it will be available, and if you attend today, it will be sent out to you via email, but also check out the Greenhouse Management website and our social platforms to make sure you don't miss it. But thanks for, for attending, and hope you all have a good rest of your day.